All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Teleshadowing. We are live on YouTube. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat box as we go along and they will be addressed. I'm honored to introduce our mentor for today, Dr. Awan. Dr. Awan is a musculoskeletal radiologist with a special interest in education and informatics. Dr. Awan is board certified by both the American Board of Radiology and the American Board of Imaging Informatics. He serves as the healthcare and public health contributor at Forbes. And Dr. Awan is also a professor and associate vice chair of education at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. His career priorities include creating and implementing innovative teaching methods and educational assessment tools and videos to make the best learning experience for students, to make it more meaningful and productive for all of his trainees and mentees as well. He also has a YouTube channel where uh, he has over 10,000 subscribers, and he remains a strong advocate for medical education, creating a formal curriculum to train residents in medical education. He's also the administrator for the Department of Wide Teaching File and also the faculty advisor for the Radiology Global Health Elective offered to the radiology residents. Now it is my honor to request Dr. Juan to begin today's session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manal Hill, for the very kind introduction. Um, let me just get my talk up. <clears throat> so this will be a very short talk, um, and then I'll be able to answer questions. So I want to just talk about my <clears throat> life as a radiologist and my journey, my journey as to why I chose radiology and how that came about. So thank you so much again. Um, I'm here. I'm a part of the University of Maryland School of Medicine faculty. Uh, thank you very much. So my journey really begins with my father, who's been my inspiration. You know, he is a pulmonologist. He's a, he practices here in Baltimore, Maryland in private practice. He's also an IMG. So what I mean by that is he's an internal, international medical grad. He graduated from Pakistan, came over here to America in the 1970s. And he gave, uh, I'm one of four brothers. He gave all of us a life that we would never have gotten had we been in Pakistan. So, you know, really my journey and what I saw from him is what motivated me and inspired me to pursue medicine in general. So this is actually a picture of, of him with three of my four kids. Um, I have another one that's 11 months old that's not in here, but um, he really is my inspiration. He's the reason why I do the things that I do. So why did I pursue medicine? Why did I even go into medicine um, as opposed to, I don't know, engineering, law, journalism, some of the other things that I maybe could have potentially considered. Well, there's a lot of reasons. I think medicine is such an amazing field where you have the opportunity to give back and to impact people's lives in a way that you're really helping other people. I mean, there's not many other fields where you're really genuinely helping others. Like you're caring for someone's body and that help. I think that altruism is at its peak when we talk about medicine. The other thing is, is that... <clears throat> There's an innate desire to help others and give back. And I think that's really important. Um, that couldn't be uh, underscored, right? I mean, I think, you know, again, I think teaching is another field where you're really just giving back and helping others. But I think medicine is equally as impactful where you're literally helping other people every single day, every minute of every day that you're actually working. And I think that's very rare in many fields. The other thing is that it's very challenging. I mean, me medical school and medicine is not easy, right? It's 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 very tough and it's uh it's not easy to do. And oftentimes the more rewarding things are the ones that are harder, right? So, you know, we challenge ourselves, we you have to learn a lot, it's tough, it's grueling, but it's also very rewarding. So um that also in itself is uh is a reason why I pursue medicine. You know, we often are uh we like the challenge, you know, like I, you know. I'm a huge basketball fan and, you know, Kobe Bryant, you know, the late Kobe Bryant talks about, you know, the mama mentality and how, you know, it's all about putting in the hard work and the challenge, the challenge to get someone. I, I saw medicine sort of as a challenge. You know, it was really, medicine has a, an opportunity to do a lot of things. You can treat patients, you can teach, you can contribute to society with writing, research, you know, especially in academia. Um, and this is, this really appealed to me because not only did I, have an interest in medicine. I also had a very profound interest in journalism. There was a time in my life where I thought that I actually wanted to be a writer, you know, but being a doctor doesn't preclude you from that. In fact, you you do a lot of writing. I do a lot of writing. I write a lot of research papers. I write a lot for other, you know, media outlets. So a real opportunity to make a huge impact and to contribute to society in a huge and meaningful way. So 
those are the main reasons why I chose to do medicine, why I wanted to pursue medicine. Now in college, of course I was pre-med, just like I'm sure many of you guys were or are currently. So I had to take, you know, the basic sciences, you know, biology, chemistry, physics, English, all those things, right? But I will say that most people who are pre-med major in a science, like they major in biology, science, I wasn't like that. I actually majored in religion and I minored in philosophy when I was in college. I went to George Washington University in Washington, D.C. And I, I put this here to remind everyone that you don't have to major in a science to go to medical school. And I'm a prime example of that, right? I majored in religion. I minored in philosophy because this is what I love. This was dear to me. I'm a, I'm a very I'm very passionate about interfaith dialogue, about philosophy, about learning humanities. And you really should pursue what you love. And, you know, uh, majoring in a non-science does not preclude you. And in fact, it may help you. And the reason why it may help you is because it shows your well-roundedness um, in, in your studies. And it also often you can do better and your GPA can be better if you're doing something that you really truly like, you know, as was the case for me, you know. And oftentimes these classes like religion and philosophy aren't as rigorous as a science class, so you can often get better grades and you may present yourself in a better light when you're applying to med school. So I really wanna make that point and make this case because uh, I think many pre-meds don't understand this. Many pre-meds don't understand. They feel that they have to major in, you know, chemistry, physics, biology, et cetera, whatever it may be. So I want you guys to know that I majored in religion, modern philosophy, and I did just fine. And I, uh, um, you know, went into med school. You don't have to major in a science. So medical school is tough, right? You know, it's it's not an easy journey. You know, it's hard as heck just to even get into med school. And, you know, you have to do really well in the MCATs. You have to do great in your grades, show diversity, show well-roundedness. And even when you get to med school, the journey's not over because it's really hard, right? I mean, you have anatomy. These pre-med classes require a lot of studying, brute memorization. You got to pass the USM release, step one, step two, step three, go through your clinical rotations. It's not, it's a long journey, right? It's a marathon, but it's rewarding. You know, nothing easy. All good things are tough, right? I mean, all things that really matter and, and, and those that you achieve, those that are hard are very rewarding at the end. That's why they're tough, right? If it was easy, not everyone, everyone would be a doctor, right? But, you know, you guys are chosen to be a doctor and you guys have put in the work and you'll reap the rewards. So I just want to make that point clear as well. I think it's very important to understand that. Now, I, you know, I went into med school and then, you know, then the question is, well, what field should you go into? And, you know, I chose diagnostic radiology. Um, and I, I considered other fields as well. You know, there was a time when I was in my, in, you know, I wanted to be a cardiothoracic surgeon, even in my third year, when I rotated through surgery, I thought, I thought wow, the heart is so cool. Operating on the heart is awesome. I want to be a cardiothoracic surgeon. And then there were times that I considered like dermatology and ophthalmology, because I thought the lifestyle was very good. But ultimately, I decided on radiology. And I'm so happy and thrilled that I picked radiology. I think it's the best field in medicine. Obviously, I'm biased, but let me explain why I chose radiology. So for me, radiology was like being a detective. It was like, you know, when I see scans of x-rays, CTs, MRIs, you kind of have to look at the images and interpret them. And you have to figure out, well, what's going on? What's not going on? What could this be? What is this not? So I felt like it was like a detective. Like I was, I was a detective. I was challenging myself intellectually to figure out, okay, well, what does, what diagnosis does this patient have? What do they not have? What could this be? Uh, what could what could this not be, right? So, you know, in a lot of ways, it was very interesting and fascinating for me. And this, you know, really resonated with me because I'm a very cerebral person. Like, I like to think a lot. I like to think about, you know, things that things are, things that they aren't. So it really appealed to sort of my personality. Radiology also has a huge impact on patient care. Think about it. The hospitals rely on radiology. Everyone is getting scans, whether you're in surgery, internal medicine, psychiatry, OBGYN, ophthalmology. It doesn't matter what field you're in. Every field is ordering scans for their patients, right? So you have a huge opportunity to, to impact patients across all fields, right? You're like, radiologists are kind of like the doctor's doctors, right? Because they're like, they're telling them what all their patients have right? So radiology had this enormous capacity and ability to implement patients 
at all you know, spectrums of subspecialties, which was another reason why I wanted to pursue radiology. I saw that firsthand when I rotated. It's very versatile. So you can do a lot in radiology. So, you know, not only am I reading studies and making diagnoses for patients, I can also do a lot of procedures. I do as a musculoskeletal radiologist, which means that I interpret, you know, images of, you know, the bones, show, like joints, uh, extremities. I also do procedures. So I do like steroid injections in joints. I do joint aspirations. I do uh, arthrograms. I even do certain biopsies, like CT guided bone biopsies for tumors, ultrasound guided tumor biopsies. So I'm doing a lot of procedures. I'm interacting with patients as well. There's a myth that radiologists just sit in a dark room and don't talk to patients. Well, that's true, maybe 75% of the time, but we all, we do a lot of procedures as well. Like there, on most days, I'm actually doing procedures as well. So I'm interacting with patients. I'm doing these procedures that I talked about. So it's very versatile. You can see that you're doing a lot of different things. You know, you're protocoling studies. Uh, you're doing a lot of very uh, important things. It's also flexibility in lifestyle. And lifestyle for me was very important, right? Because I wanted to, and that's kind of why I didn't pursue cardiothoracic surgery because the hours were very grueling, right? You know, I wanted to pick a field where I do what I love, and I love my profession, but I also have a life outside of work. So, you know, I, I'm married, I have four kids. Um, you know, it's, it's, I also, I'm, I'm, I'm a very religious person. Like I like to attend Friday prayers, you know, as part of my religion, I have to, you know, step out on, in the middle of Friday from like, you know, 1230 to two o'clock to, to, to do a prayer. So, you know, I needed some flexibility in my lifestyle and not all you know, specialties in medicine allow you that or afford that. So radiology was a field that allows that flexibility that, you know, you work, I work eight to five mainly, you know, I work Monday to Friday, eight to five. I'm not working evenings. I'm not working nights on the weekends, every sixth or seventh week I am, you know, working. Um, I take call, but again, that's eight to five Saturday, eight to five Sunday. So my hours are pretty, uh, predictable and they're not bad right and so uh, this radiology really gave me this flexibility to be a family man to pursue my uh religious obligations and just was allows for wellness for me at home and i love doing it you know it's it's honestly not work for me uh i i love going in interpreting studies you know having an impact on patient care i also i'm going to talk about this in a second because i'm in academics i get to teach i get to write and all these things are things that i absolutely love to do so you know even me going eight to five even though it's only nine hours a day when i go monday to friday like i actually enjoy doing it i love doing it and um if i had to pick a specialty again you know I, I picked 16 years ago i would pick radiology again in a heartbeat i mean that's how much i absolutely love the work that i do <clears throat> so my day-to-day -day is it really depends on, you know, you in radiology, you can be in the private practice sector or you can be in academics. Like my younger brother, for example, is an interventional radiologist. Um, he does a lot of procedures. He's in the more private practice, but I'm in academics. I work at University of Maryland, which means that I teach residents and I write, re I do research and I write papers. So my day-to-day -day is very different. So on a typical day, I'll get to the hospital by 7.30, 7.45. I'll read study. I'll open up the list. Uh, on the PAC system, the computer system, I'll see what studies are available. I'll start reading some studies like CTs, MRIs. By 8, 8.30, residents and fellows come in the reading room and they start reading studies as well. So fellows are people that are getting, you know, they've completed their residency, but they're doing a one-year subspecialty focused to master a certain part of imaging. In this case, musculoskeletal radiology, because I'm an MSK radiologist. We have residents in our program who are who have graduated medical school and now are training to become radiologists. So we have about 38 residents in our uh, radiology program at University of Maryland. So every day there'll be two or three residents that are coming into MSK radiology and rotating with us. So I teach them and they'll look at studies. And then when they're done looking at the study, they'll come over to me and I'll go over the study with them. So that happens on a daily basis. I'm teaching residents. I'm also teaching fellows on a daily basis. So, and that's inter interwoven with my work. So I may be reading some studies on my own, I may be reading some studies with residents. I may be reading some studies with fellows. I also teach medical students. So I'm, I'm the director of the radiology. I'm the co-director of the radiology <clears throat> clerkship for the University of Maryland School of Medicine that happens in the third year, in the third, third or fourth year clerkship. So um, I often teach, I have medical students in the reading room when I'm teaching. I often give them lectures on a weekly basis on radiology. Um, so they're, I'm doing a lot of teaching the same time I'm doing my clinical work. And then also we get administrative time. So every week 
one day or one and a half day, I have academic time. I have dedicated time to do my administrative roles. So, you know, because I'm, you know, the associate vice chair of education, I have to oversee all the education, which means the fellowships, the residency and the medical student education in the Department of Radiology at the University of Maryland. I have time to prepare lectures during that time and time to write papers. So I do a lot of research, particularly in education. My focus is on education. So there's a journal called Academic Radiology where I actually have my own column in that journal. So every month I write an educational perspective. So I need time to write those perspectives. So that day, day and a half a week where I get administrative time is used for me to write some of those papers. So you can see that throughout the course of the day, I'm not only reading and I'm also doing procedures in that time. So <clears throat> there may be a joint aspiration, a steroid injection, a biopsy that I do that I you know, meld in to that day. So my day is very dynamic. I'm doing a lot of different things throughout the day. And usually I'm done by five and then I go home. But academics is different than private practice. So my younger brother who's in private practice, you know, the salary is obviously more in private practice. You read more. It's a busier day in private practice. You get more vacation time. You know, typically I get about, you know, five to six weeks of vacation at University of Maryland as a, as a academic radiologist. In private practice, you can get up to 12 weeks, 12 to 13 weeks of vacation throughout the year, right? So you may ask, well, why does anyone do academics? Well, the pace of the day, even though the salary is a little less, you read less during the day. So your pace is a little bit more chill. Like you're not like killing yourself every day reading, you know, you know, 50 studies or something. You may read 25 or 30 studies throughout the day, right? Because you're also teaching, you need time to teach. Um, so the day is a little chiller, right? And you also get the opportunity to teach. Like I love teaching. I love interacting with people. I like doing research. I like writing. So, you know, it it appeals to me more. Like the, the academic lifestyle appeals to me more. And I really enjoy interacting with trainees and having an impact on them and imparting knowledge on them so that they can do good, you know, in the future. So that's really my impetus for doing academics. So academics in general, whether it's radiology, ophthalmology, internal medicine, family medicine, surgery, it's always a three-part mission of clinical work, teaching, and research. You're expected to be a clinician, take care of patients. You're expected to teach, teach medical students, residents, fellows, and you're expected to do research, contribute to the field positively by writing evidence-based manuscripts, right? So that's the three-part mission of all academic uh, departments, and radiology is no exception to that. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the clinical work that I do. So, you know, my job mainly is to interpret imaging studies. So that could be x-rays, CTs, MRIs, ultrasounds of the musculoskeletal system. So this is an example of a x-ray of the shoulder. And notice that, does anyone know what this is, by the way? I would love to hear if people, what is, you know, there's a problem with this shoulder. Does anyone know what the problem with this shoulder is? You can unmute yourself and just say what you think it is. Does anyone have any ideas about what this is? Don't be shy. It's okay. I'm just guessing there, there's a bone fracture. Okay, you're close. Yeah, I mean, um, you're close. There's, it's, there's, it's not fractured, but the shoulder is dislocated, right? This humeral head should be articulating it should be right here. It should be overlapping with the glenoid process of the scapula, but it's been it's been dislocated. See how the humerus is sort of inferiorly and medially displaced with respect to the glenoid. So this is like an anterior glenohumeral joint dislocation. This is a CT image through the proximal thighs. And this dense area is the bone. All this is the muscle. And this darker area is a sub-Q fat. But this super dark stuff here is gas. So there's actually gas insinuating between the muscles fascial planes here and the scrotal area here. So we call this necrotizing fasciitis. You'll learn about this in med school. This is a surgical emergency. Um, so this is a nice case of what necrotizing fasciitis would look like in the thighs. And then <clears throat> this is an MRI example of the same necrotizing fasciitis. This is the bone here. This is the muscle. All this bright stuff is edema. And you can see bright fluid and edema insinuating between fascial planes. So this is just another example of what necrotizing fasciitis would look like on an MRI. So, you know, this is an X-ray a CT and an MRI. So just, you know, gives you sort of a breadth of experience of what, you know, the type of studies and imaging that I kind of look at and I interpret. So in terms of teaching, I like to teach. I teach medical students. I teach residents. I teach fellows. It's, it's different teaching all of them because they're at different levels of learning, right? So I have to tailor my lectures and my talks and my experiences to their level of training to make sure that it's meaningful to them. I'm a huge proponent of interactive learning, audience response, flipped classroom techniques, all these innovative teaching methods um, 
that are very important to engage learners. I, I, I'm a real believer in engaging learning and engaging learners. So I often uh, have multiple choice questions in my in my lectures and my, I use audience response, but this is just a glimpse of, you know, where is the abnormality on this chest X-ray? So this is a chest X-ray in a pediatric patient. <clears throat> where is the abnormality in the right upper lobe, right lower lobe, left upper lobe, or left lower lobe? And again, I would love for someone just to kind of answer this question. Uh, you can unmute and tell me what you think. Where do you think the abnormality is on this chest X-ray? Is it B? B, right lower lobe. Okay. Okay. That's a that's a thought. Anyone have any other thoughts? It would be C. C, left upper lobe. Okay. Any I other also thoughts? I agree with C. Is I it A? A, I like A. I, whoever said A, I like that, right? So, so this is a... So the left lung, this is the heart right here, right? So this heart, this here is the heart. This is the midline. This is the trachea. This is the spine here. This is the right lung, which should all be dark and black because air is black. This is the left lung. But there's this big, dense opacity here. This is the right upper lobe. This is the right upper lobe pneumonia, right? So, we, um, so this dense opacity here is the right upper lobe. So this is a right upper lobe round pneumonia in a child, okay? The right lower lobe would be down here. The left upper lobe would be here. The left lower lobe would be right here, right? And this is the heart, of course. The right is, remember, in, <clears throat> in radiology, this is the right side. This is the left side. Okay, Even though this is the left of the image, this is the right side of the body. This is the left side of the body. So the answer here would be right upper lobe. That's where the abnormality is here, okay? Let's just do one more question. So this is a 65-year-old male that's a white alcoholic. Being white and being alcoholic is important for this case presents with acute great toe pain. So there's a lot of toe pain here um, with, that is red. So this area here is, is painful, okay? What type of arthritis does this person have? Is this, is this a case of, case of DJD or osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, gout, or lupus? What type of arthritis does this? Is it gout? It's gout. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, I hope the history kind of gave it away too. Older male, that's white, alcoholic, and great toe, right? Gout commonly affects the great toe, but you can see all this soft tissue swelling. There's some calcification here from gouty tophi. And you can see these erosions, right? Patients with gout have, first of all, this first MTP joint, this is the first metatarsophalangeal joint. This is the most common joint to be involved in gout in the entire body, right? This is, you know, gout. And then this, notice that it almost looks like, like a rat ate out a piece of this bone. There's this like very well-defined erosion or loss of bone at the metatarsal head, right? So gout characteristically causes these juxtaarticular well-defined erosions, okay? And so this is a very nice example, classic example of what gout looks like. So great job. This is a case of gout, okay? Gouty arthritis, okay? So that's just a glimpse of some of the teaching that I do to med students, <clears throat> residents. I try to use multiple choice questions. I try to engage. I try to use audience response, maybe poll everywhere to do some of this stuff. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's the type of stuff we do. I also write, I, again, I told you I write about education. This is the journal, um, Academic Radiology. I have a, I, I write on the educational perspectives. I have my own column in the journal. Every month I write something. So this was a, uh, a, a article I wrote on insights on delivering an effective radiology resident lecture, how to give a great lecture, right? So I, I wrote about that. I wrote an article giving my tips on how to give and how to deliver a great lecture, pretty much how to engage residents, how to keep them from checking their phones, how to keep them, their attention on you. So this is, you know, and I write, I, I've written on like the flip classroom, the spirit of lifelong learning, the importance of communication, um, gamification. I mean, a lot, of, I mean, simulation, all topics related to education. So that's kind of what I do <clears throat> in, in my research and in the writing that I do. So those are educational perspectives that I write about, okay? Um, and then I also believe in making an impact, having a life of service. So I have my own YouTube channel. It's called MedED Page. I would love for everyone to subscribe to the channel because I think there's a lot of great things for all of you guys to learn. So please subscribe to my channel. It's called MedED Page. It's all one word, M-E-D-E-D-P-A-G-E. -E -E. I have tons of great stuff. I mean, a lot of stuff on there is like for public health, um, for radiology stuff, but there's also med student stuff. I have USMLE tutorials. I have like over 26 USMLE tutorial videos on tips on how to ace the USMLE and, you know, tutorials like on big topics like intracranial hemorrhage, bone tumors, um, pneumonia, child abuse, all sort of stuff. So very helpful for your medical careers. Also have 
a ton of videos, like over 20 videos on like the residency match, like tips on how to ace the match, like how to ace your resin, your interview, your virtual interview, how to write a good personal statement. Five mistakes people make on personal statements, how to avoid them, how to uh, decipher the culture of a residency program, how to write a letter of intent, how to communicate with residency programs, all these type of videos I have. And I give my tips as a program director. So <clears throat> I think it'll be very beneficial for all of you guys. So, you know, and I do this YouTube channel because it's a way to make a global impact, right? Um, and, you know, I just have fun doing it because I love to teach and I really enjoy teaching. So um, hopefully you guys can check that out. Okay. So YouTube, I think is really a way to allow for globalization of education. So it allows there to be, you know, affect people all across the globe, right? Because um, YouTube is, uh, is everywhere. You know, if you want to figure out, okay, well, how do I change the knob on my faucet. You'll, oft, you'll often go to YouTube and figure that out, right? So the same is true in education. If you want to learn about something, often people turn to YouTube and everyone around the globe is using it. Now, things like Twitter. So for example, I'm on Twitter. My Twitter handle is Rad. Please, if you're on Twitter, follow me. That'd be great. But Twitter, for example, isn't used that often in like Australia and like continents like Australia, but very heavily used in America, right? So Twitter doesn't have the same global effect that like YouTube does, right? YouTube is a little different. So um but Twitter is also very good. I, I post regularly on Twitter daily, maybe two or three tweets, try to give some educational pearls on Twitter. So uh, so if you're on Twitter, please follow me as well. So um, YouTube is really unique in that sense. You can have a far reaching impact by helping others, educating, offering advice. I try to post a lot of public health stuff, you know, radiology education stuff and medical student education stuff on YouTube. And that's another way that I've been able to really find meaning in my, in my career. You can see these are my different playlists. I talk about a lot of things like, you know, my Forbes articles, I write, I'm a public health contributor for Forbes. I have public health videos. These are the match and residency tip videos that I was talking about. Uh, these are the USM lead domination tutorials that I was talking about these videos, but I have musculoskeletal radiology cases for residents, MRI tutorials for residents, resident call prep cases for residents, some of the lectures that I've given, you know, so you can see that I've divided this and I've really tried to have a, a wide spectrum of audience for many of the different videos that I have, you know, on YouTube. All right. And then I also enjoy public health and public health advocacy. So I'm actually a Forbes contributor for public health. This is a recent article I wrote maybe last month, America's obsession with alcohol. Will it ever end? So I love, remember I told you, I really love journalism and I love to write. Well, this was a way for me to satisfy my love for writing. So writing regularly, I try to write on a weekly basis for Forbes, uh, some major or big article in public health. So this was another way that I could contribute positively to, uh, to advocacy and to public health. So you can see that, you know, a life in medicine is very complete. It's allowed me to do everything that I love, really. Like this life in medicine and being a physician has allowed me to do everything that I love. I love taking care of patients. I'm able to do that by reading studies. I love to teach and give back. I'm able to do that in academia by teaching fellows, residents, and med students. I love to write and speak. I absolutely love that. Um, so, and I do that by giving lectures at national meetings by going on YouTube and giving lectures, by writing for Forbes, by writing for academic radiology. Um, I'm able to satisfy all my interests through the field of medicine. So you can see how versatile being a doctor and being a physician is, right? And I'm having fun. I love doing this type of stuff. I love talking to you guys. I love the, what I'm doing right now, you know, for telemedicine. So um, just a great way to give back, right? You can do it all. You can do this, all of this, and you can do much more that even I haven't done, right? The sky is really the limit for what you can accomplish in medicine. There's so much you can do in medicine, which is why I think this field is so unique. The path is long. It's tough. It's it, it's brutal at times, but it's worth it, right? It's, it's really worth it. And you can get a lot, you can get a lot of meaning in your life and you can contribute so positively to your life and the life of so many others in doing this type of work, right? So, you know, hard work always pays off. Your mom and dad were right when they told you that hard work pays off. It absolutely does. You can just do great things um, with, with medicine. So, um, for that, you know, that's all I really wanted to say. I wanted to keep this short and brief to have opportunities to answer questions. So please, uh, if there are any questions or concerns, um, please, you know, feel free to ask them. This is my email in case anyone wants to ever get a hold of me, umar.awan at umm.edu. Please subscribe to my YouTube page, MedED page. Please follow me on Twitter. Um, that's all I ask. And thank you so much for your attention. Appreciate it. Thank you for your mentorship and teaching, Dr. Owen. We will now begin our Q&A session. So my name is Hamza, and I'm a student in the BSDO program with Seton Hill University and the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine. 
To start off our Q&A, we separated your questions received based on your presentation and based on your career. We'll start off the questions from your presentation. On an x-ray, how do we differentiate types of pneumonia like interstitial? Okay. It's a little tough and it's hard to do that for people that aren't radiology residents, but it really depends on <clears throat> usually like bacterial pneumonia, for example, is more like it's confined to a lobe, like a lobe of the lung and it's like dense opacity. Viral pneumonia typically is more interstitial, I meaning it's like more linear. The, the, the bright opacities tend to be a little bit more linear and they emanate from the hilum, like more centrally from the heart, right? So, uh, but it can be very variable, right? Fungal pneumonia often looks a little different as well. Um, so it depends on the, the distribution of the findings and also the, uh, the morphology of the, of the opacity, like whether it's confined to a lobe or is it like linear and more linear? So that's what I would say is how you differentiate the two and, and the many different, uh, pathologies in pneumonia. Thank you. Now, the next question I have is what are the findings of chest x-rays on patients who have COVID-19? Okay. So COVID, it can be variable. Most commonly, actually, an x-ray is negative. It's like a normal, patients that have COVID will have a normal chest x-ray. That's the most common scenario. Now, a COVID pneumonia typically uh, involves the periphery of the lungs. So you'll start to see opacities along the periphery of the lung, right? And often it often has like a more basal distribution, meaning that it involves the dependent portion of the lungs, like the lower lobes, okay? So when you start to see like pneumonia appearance or opacities along the periphery of the lung, um, and along the base, um, you can have consolidation, you can have ground glass opacity, which is like this hazy appearance. Those are all findings typical for COVID pneumonia. Thank you very much. Um, now the next question, how do you position the patient in the apical lordotic view? The apical lordotic view usually, that's a really specific question for a, a med student. I'm, I'm surprised that that was asked, but <laughs> it's usually, forgive me, my I have some like, I'm recovering from a sickness, but um, the apical lordotic view accentuates the lung apices, like right under the clavicles, right? So by tilting the patient, you know, you're able to see the lung apices a little bit better. And that's typically what an apical lordotic view is. Mm. All right. Now for our next question, how long does it take to learn how to read x-rays or CT scans? Because often when someone shows me these scans, it's real hard to see the abnormalities until they're pointed out to you. Yeah, it's very tough. That's why radiology is a four-year residency, right? You don't learn this skill in medical school. You're not going to, you know, you're going to go through med school. You're not going to learn how to read diagnostic studies. That's why we have a residency program. And the residency program is four years for good reason, because it takes time to develop the skill and acumen to really learn radiology effectively, right? So um, there's a first year, second year, third year, and a fourth year, and you learn all the different pathologies, um, all the different imaging modalities like x-ray, ultrasound, CT, MRI, nuclear medicine, it takes time. And that's why, you know, you, you, you rotate, you know, I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist, but you spend some time in MSK radiology, some time in neuroradiology, pediatric radiology, ultrasound, body imaging, chest radiology, trauma radiology, interventional radiology, mammography, all these different sections you are learning. Um, and it takes four years to really gain mastery of that. Right. Now, a related question, how do you differentiate between calcification and brain bleed on CT scans of the head? Okay, well, a calcification is going to be, they're both dense. They're both going to be bright. Calcium is way more dense. Okay, calcium, there's something called a Hounsfield unit. You can put like a ROI, like a region of interest on the thing. And if it, the brighter, the, the, the higher the number, it's more likely to be calcium. But it's usually not that hard. <clears throat> and usually calcium is very bright and a, a, a bleed is bright, but it's not that bright. You know what I mean? So it's, you know, once you've seen a couple of them, that won't take four years to learn, right? That'll take a day to learn. You know, the difference between like calcification and and, and what a bleed looks like on a, on, a, on a head scan, on a CT scan. Now, how do we differentiate between an ischemic stroke and hemorrhage stroke on a brain CT? Because one is going to have blood. One's going to have bright, sick, bright attenuation, right? So one's going to have, um, you know, they're both going to have... <clears throat> A stroke really means that you've lost the, you know, there's something called like the, the gray white differentiation, gray white matter differentiation, right? Like in the, in the, in the brain, you have gray matter and white matter, and you can see the difference on a CT scan. When you, when that gets blurred or that gets obscured, you know that you have some ischemia and you, you know that you've probably infarcted the brain. And 
it's going to become dark. Now, if there's bright areas in there, that means that there's blood in there as well, which means that it's a hemorrhagic stroke. <clears throat> now, what is the difference between hypodense and hyperdense in imaging? Okay, so hypodense, it just means hypo is dark, hyper is bright, right? So, it, but you, what, but then the question is, well, compared to what, right? So that though there are relative terms, hypodense and hyperdense. We talk about density on a CT scan because everything is about density, right? The house view units. So usually we compare it to the brain parenchyma or the gray matter. So if something is hyper, like blood is hyper dense because it's bright, right? An infarct would be hypodense because it's dark, okay? So hmm, that's the difference. How do you differentiate between hypo, uh, hypoechoic and hyperechoic in imaging? Okay, that's, Sorry, a, still a lot of so that's the same questions. question, but just on ultrasound, right? So again, hyperechoic means it's bright, hyperechoic, right? And it, you always have to compare it to some sort of reference, like hyperechoic to what? You have to specify what you mean, like hyperechoic to the liver parenchyma, hyperechoic to <clears throat> the pancreas. It depends on what you're talking about, but hyperechoic tends to be bright, brighter than something, some reference point. Hypoechoic means darker than some reference point on ultrasound. We're talking about ultrasound there. Right. Now, can you please go over the different types of imaging views that are predominantly used? Like, for example, sagittal, medial, trans, et cetera, and why they may be used? Okay, well, that's an interesting question. That question, uh, it depends on the type of study you're using. So, for example, in cross-sectional imaging like CT and MRI, we typically do three planes, an axial plane, a coronal plane, and a sagittal plane. That's just the to get a three-dimensional – because your body is a three-dimensional structure. So we have to look at things on multiple views, right? So an axial, if you, if you imagine yourself laying down, an axial would be like chopping your body like a loaf of bread, like, right? That's an axial, that's an axial image of your body. Coronal image is looking at your body top to bottom, like from your head to your foot. That's what a coronal means. And a sagittal is you're turned 90 degrees and you're looking laterally. And then it's looking, it's like looking at your body and 90 degrees to the coronal. Okay, so that's the that's an between axial, coronal, and sagittal. That's for like CTs and MRIs. Now on X-rays, an X-ray is just one image. It's not named, it's not three dimensional structure, right? So we often do different views. Like an AP is an anterior posterior view. Like the chest X-ray that I showed you and the foot X-ray that I showed you was an AP, an anterior posterior view, right? But you can have a lateral, which would be ninety degrees to that. You could have an oblique, which is an angle, like maybe 25, 30 degrees to the AP view, right? So you can do different views to try to see things in an orthogonal plane, right? Because and when you're looking at pathology, one view is no view. You may have heard that mantra in radiology. One view is no view, right? You have to really look at things on different views to really quantify and assess and describe pathology effectively and correctly. Now we'll be switching gears a bit more into questions about your career journey and specialty. Okay. So, I'll start with uh, your residency program. So which residency program did you go to and which medical school did you graduate, you graduate from? Okay, I went to George Washington University Medical School and I actually went to University of Maryland for my residency, the same place I am right now. That's where I did my radiology residency. Now, this is a question that relates to a lot of people here, including myself. So when you were in medical school, how did you manage your classes and attend Friday prayers and especially during Ramadan, the night prayers, the that are prayers? Yeah, so um, I'm going to tell you what I did, but I'm not advocating that this is what everyone should do, right? So I I didn't really go to class that often in medical school, right? So, and I think that's a common theme now. Like, I think like, you know, I learned, you know, I did in my, my first year, my first semester, I, I went to every class. I went to every class. Class was eight to five, but then I realized I was burning out because I would go to class eight to five and then I would study like five hours or so a day like that same night. So you can imagine I was, I was going to class eight to five, took a break, maybe study from like seven to like 11, 1130. Like the whole day was like spent studying. And although I did well, I realized like my whole day was like just studying and I wasn't able to do other things like go to the gym and take care of myself and do these other things. I mean, I, I would always pray and stuff. I'd have no problem praying my prayers, going to Friday prayer, you know, was easy because it was only like two blocks away. Like GW med school was here. And like, we, we used to do our Friday prayer at the church that was like two blocks away from the medical school. Right. So very easy for me to like, go just take a break 30 minutes and come back. Right. But I realized that my day was very full and like, I didn't have time to do anything. So I actually, and we got the notes, like the class, they gave you the notes that you needed that were that was going to be used for the exam. So 
there was like a printout of the notes that the professor would give you. So I realized, well, why don't I just take the notes, study on my own and be on my own time? And then that actually worked out a lot better for me for the rest of med school. I would actually, I didn't, I rarely went to class. I would just study on my own. I would read notes on my own time. I would go to the gym, meet with friends. I'd have more ownership of my day. I could kind of dictate my day a little bit better. So it became a lot easier when I made that decision. Now I'm not advocating that everyone do that, but it worked for me, right? And may, maybe it'll work for you, but you kind of have to find what your sweet spot is and what your sweet spot is in terms of how you study effectively and how you can manage your day the best you possibly can. Some classes are required and you have to go to, but others aren't. On the ones that weren't, I did not go to, you know? So um, that's sort of how I affected it. And, you know, it just, it's just about priorities. The same way you prioritize praying, if, if you're a Muslim, if you're praying, it's the same way you prioritize praying in college, you know? You take time off, you just take five minutes out of your day to pray Dhuhr or Asr or whatever it is, you know, you need to do. So, um, so yeah, that's my answer for that. All right. Thank you. Now, the next question I have is again related to you and your uh, and you being Muslim. So I watched your YouTube channel and I know you mentioned you have memorized the entire Quran. So around what time in your life did you memorize it? And when you were during when you were in medical school and residency, how did you find time to revise it to make sure you didn't forget it? Yeah, good. So I memorized it right before med school. So I actually I took a year and a half off. So I graduated college a semester early. And then I took a year off between college and med school to finish it all. So I, I was part of a, a, a HIFS program. For those of you who aren't Muslim, that means, you know, memorizing the whole Quran in the Arabic language. I was part of a program um, at a mosque where I did it. I would go every day and I would, you know, recite with other kids and stuff like that. So it took me about 20 months to memorize the whole Quran. So I did it actually between college and med school, to be precise. Um, in med school, I didn't read much Quran. I'll be flat out honest. I did not. I, I, in fact, I forgot a lot of the Quran in med school because I didn't, I didn't have time to do it, quite frankly. You know what I mean? Because I was always studying for med, med school. Again, it's tough. But I, I'm proud to say that I do it now on a daily basis. So like, yes, even yesterday, I spent an hour reading Quran and I was revising. I'm going to do it today after this, after this session right here that I have with you guys. So, um, so I do, I make time for it regularly now, but I, I will say that during medical school, and even residency, I wasn't doing it regularly. Um, it's it's very tough to do, but I'm not saying, I mean, you should, I mean, if you're doing it, you should, but for me, I'm going to be honest, I wasn't able to do it. I, I was not able to do it effectively during med school and, and, and residency. Now, this question relates a bit more to the, both the last question and this question combined. So were you able to do your Tarawih prayers during medical school or residency, the night prayers during Ramadan? Because yeah. we know those are long. Yeah, I was. I, I had no problem doing that. Yeah, I had, I would just, again, like I was structuring my day so that I would, you know, you know, review notes, study during the day. And then at nighttime, I would I would just go and do Tarawih. Right? Tarawih is only like an hour, hour and a half, right? So no problem for me doing that. I mean, some days, I mean, if it was like the night before an exam, maybe not. You know what I mean? Like I would, and maybe I would just do it on my own in my room. But I mean, I would, most days I was able to do it. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no now, for the next question that I have coming up, how did you, thank you, Dr. Han, this is incredibly helpful for the Muslim students pursuing medicine, but how did you become a public health contributor at Forbes? And was there an, an I, got, I got lucky. I got completely lucky. So, um, and this is recent. I just became a contributor in November, like the beginning of November, like the first week of November. So it's only been like three or four months, but um, I write op-eds. You know, I write, I, I was writing some op-eds like, just because I like, I, like I said, I like to write. I've always been had this journalism focus, right? Like I've always wanted to be a writer. And so I would write, I wrote, I wrote a couple op-eds this last year on like COVID and the vaccine about ri racism and Islam. Like I would write some stuff for like the Baltimore Sun, the Baltimore Banner that got published. And there was a Forbes writer that saw one of my op-eds and D like they DM me, they messaged me and they were like, hey, like, we really like your writing style. Would you consider writing for Forbes? I mean, they they actually invited me to do it. You know, I didn't, I wasn't like actively reaching out to them. So I got lucky. I don't know what the, I don't know how it normally happens for people, but I was just kind of asked. I was approached by them and I, I got very lucky and um, I'm very thankful for the opportunity because I, I really like enjoy, I, I enjoy that platform very much. They're, they're great people there. They really support, you know, the writing that I do. So um, I would say I got lucky and I, that's probably true for most people. It's, it's kind of like luck. 
Now, what brings you inspiration? Because you told me you do an article every week. What, you, what brings you inspiration to start writing certain topics for Forbes? So how do you get your ideas to write something every week? I, you know, it's just, I like to write about public health. I, you know, I, I did an MPH, so I did my MPH from Harvard University in, in, in master's in public health. So I feel like I'm an expert in public health and I know a lot. There's a lot that I would I want to say, you know, and I did, there's so much you can talk about in public health. I mean, it's just about, you know, general health for the population, right? So, you know, it's not, for me, it's honestly not that hard to come up with a topic on what I want to talk about, what I want to advocate on. And I like to just, you know, see what's on the news, what's being focused on in the news, and maybe think about a way that I can do it that'll resonate with people and in a way that people will understand the topic. So sometimes I'll talk about COVID. Sometimes I'll talk about the vaccine. Sometimes I'll talk about like obesity, alcohol. I even talked about, I, I did one on um, um, hate speech and its effect on the health of Muslim Americans. So it just depends on like after the shoot, the mass shootings. Like I, I asked the question, well, why is it that when people, when there's mass shootings in America, if it's a Muslim, everyone says, oh, this person is, they, 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 they identify him by their faith and they say that he's a terrorist. But if it's any other person, like what happened in Monterey Park, they're never identified by their faith and they're never called a terrorist. So then I asked that question and then I wrote an article about that and I, and I showed how that is affecting the health of Muslim Americans. So, you know, I like to just, you know, do it on a topic that's kind of timely about something that's kind of going on in, in the news. And now this question that's coming up is from one of our pre-med students. How did you integrate your passion for your religion with your medical school application, given you also had your pre-medical experiences covered? How did I, can you ask the question again? How did I integrate my... So your passion for religion, because you're a religion major, yeah. and how you integrated that with your medical school application. Yeah, I because I talked about that in my personal statement. So I, I talked about how me being a religion major will make me a great doctor. That's kind of like, actually, that was literally what I wrote about in my personal statement. So I that's how I integrated it. So I, I said that there's a, you know, I talked about that there's a spiritual component to being a doctor. You know, there's a spiritual component to connecting with patients, listening to them, hearing them, being able to, you know, understand, you know, it's not just about the disease. It's about what they're feeling. It's about their beliefs and being able to comfort them and to listen to them and to resonate with them in a way that, that allows somebody to heal. And my expertise in religion will allow me to be a better doctor. So that's literally what I talked about in my personal statement. So, um, so it was very intertwined and, and very integrated in the way I presented myself as an applicant to medical school. Now, this question is going back to your work as radiology. As a radiologist, which other healthcare providers are on your patient care team? Which other healthcare providers are on my what team? Patient care team. Oh, well, we, I work with a ton of people. I work with not only radiologists, I work with nurses, you know, especially when I'm doing procedures. I work with radiology technologists. So people that are helping, you know, if there's a fluoroscopy study, you know, there's techs there that are helping get the patient, you know, preparing the patient. I work with other techs that are doing the studies. So the, the CT techs that are actually doing the CT study, the MRI study. Um, I work for, with administrators that are organizing and, and ordering studies and making sure the orders are done for procedures. Um, I work with, you know, the chairman, other faculty members, students, trainees. You can see there's a ton of people that we're working with, you know, in concert. It takes a village to for, for, for patient care to be successful. Right. Now, what is the role of the radiologist during the treatment of patients? Or is your primary role in the diagnosis in identifying patient injury? Well, it, it, it's, it's both. I mean, it's mainly diagnosis. We're making, di we're making diagnostic uh, inferences, but there is some treatment. You know, you know, we, for example, I do steroid injections. That's treating the patient. That's treating the patient's arthritis or pain by putting steroid into a joint, right? So, um, it's me and in intervention radiology. So that in, for me, it's mainly diagnosis. I do some treatment, but it's mainly diagnosis, right? But in intervention radiology, they're often doing a lot of treatment, right? With their procedures, like they're embolizing, they're stopping bleeds through embolization. They're, uh, you know, they're, you know, they're doing uterine fibroid embolizations. Uh, they're doing percutaneous nephrostomies to stop hydronephrosis in the kidney, right? They're putting a metaport in to, treat cancer, right? So, you know, there's a lot more therapy or therapeutic options in interventional radiology. But in, for me, I would say 90% of what I do is diagnosis and maybe 10% is, is therapeutic. All right. Now, many rising pre-med students have the understanding that AI might make radiology obsolete. 
And can you please advise on how AI can potentially shape the future of diagnostic radiology? Good. I'm glad somebody asked that question because that's an important question. And the answer is no, it's not obsolete. In fact, people have been saying that for the last 20 years, but I still have a job. And in fact, I have, I'm doing more and more and I'm working harder than I ever have than 20 years ago. You know what I mean? So that's a myth. It's completely false. I want to debunk that myth. And in fact, AI is not only, it's not going to make AI obsolete. It's going to make, AI, it's going to make radiology even more relevant. And let me explain what I mean by that, because what AI is going to do is it's going to make all of our systems more efficient. It's going to make the way we are able to read studies more efficient. It's going to make you know the scheduling more efficient. We're going to be able to do more. Uh, we're going to be able to interact with computer softwares that will allow us to do more in a more efficient manner. It'll make us more efficient and competent radiologists. So the only thing that's going to become obsolete is if uh, a radiologist doesn't use AI. Those radiologists that don't use AI will be obsolete, but radiology will not be obsolete. There's just such a huge demand for it, and it just continues to grow. So um, I want to put that myth to rest. You know, I've done a lot of, you know, I also do informatics. Like I'm a, I, I'm board certified in imaging informatics. So I know a lot about the technology and the AI side of things. So I want everyone to understand that it's, that's, you know, radiology is just growing because of AI, not the, not the opposite. Okay, thank you. Because this is a question I've actually had for a lot of people. Uh, one of my friends is studying AI right now. And he, I asked a similar question regarding whether AI would become advanced enough. Now he said something specifically that it would be really, really hard for AI to re replicate anything like the human brain or even get close to that. Do you agree with that sentiment? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because at the end of the day, you know, it, you know, you, you can't replace the human and the human factor, right? The human factor of, you know, having, you know, uh, an expert opinion on something, you know, and relating to a patient and, you know, um, yes, AI will be able to make certain findings on a CT scan and stuff. Maybe it'll be able to generate a report, but then how to put that report into context, right? Like how to put, okay, well, yes, you think that this, you think that's, this is what it is, but what, what is it not? Like, you know, when you give a differential diagnosis of, you know, the top three things that it could be, or, or, well, why is it this? And why is it not? AI can't do that. Right. So um, it's a humanistic aspect of it that AI is lacking, but will it help us? Absolutely. It's going to make us so much better radiologists and it'll be, be more effective, but that humanistic aspect will be lacking always. Now for our last two questions, do you have any advice for students who are interested in learning more about pursuing a career in radiology? Yeah, my advice is twofold. My advice is one, express your interest early and uh, and get involved in, uh, you know, radiology, whether, you know, find a mentor so that they can guide you, immerse yourself in radiology, you know, do the radiology elective, you know, make your visibility known and, you know, do radiology rotation so you can see it. And then two, check out my YouTube channel because I have tons of stuff there for radiology. I give so much advice there. I have all sorts of radiology stuff there. And you'll learn a lot. And, you know, even like how to like ace your radiology clerkship, all that advice is there, what to do um, in, in terms of that type of stuff, tons of radiology cases. So I think you'll benefit from that. So those are my twofold piece of advice for people who want to pursue radiology. Now, here's our last question. Given your multiple hats in academia, public health, how you're, um, you're somebody who's memorizing terrible and how you're a radiologist, how do you manage your life or your work-life balance? It's tough. It's not easy. I mean, I uh, I don't know that I do a great job of it, to be honest with you. But I also, you know, family is also huge for me too. That's probably number one. You know, my wife and four kids and stuff. So um, it just comes to, you know, praying, prioritizing things, right? You know, you you have a schedule for what the things that you want to do, things that you want to accomplish on a daily basis, right? So you have to do those type of things and prioritize what's really important, and then you know, leave the rest for if you have time, right? So it's all about your timing and your priorities. So. Uh, you know, for me, the priorities are family, religion, and then profession. So I try to prioritize my day with that. I don't watch a lot of TV. I mean, that's, you know, I have brought, like my brothers watch tons of shows on Netflix and stuff. I, I just don't do that because I don't have time to do it. Um, I do watch sports. I'm guilty of watching sports like basketball and stuff. In fact, I'm going to the Washington Wizards game tonight with my son. So I'm excited for that. Um, so I do do that, but, you know, honestly, I just prioritize and try to do the things that I really want to do. Um, and I guess that's how I can do some of the things that I do, but, um, I just try my best like you guys, no different than you guys. Hey, thank you very much, Dr. Allen. These are all the questions we have for today. And we really appreciate you taking the time to mentor us today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it very much. I'd love for everyone to please give a warm thank you to Dr. Owen in the chat box and subscribe to his YouTube channel.
MedEd page, link it in, in the chat for this incredible, and thank you for this incredibly informative session. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right, now we'll have our closing session with our quiz and future session dates. Um, the link to subscribe to Dr. Yvonne's channel is also in the chat. I've linked it a couple of times. I know I've used it personally. It's been very, very helpful to me. I know I used it when I was interviewing for medical school and uh, I know his are, gear, are more geared towards residency, but they're also applicable to med school as well. So for those interviews, you know, why medicine and all these tips and tricks he gave, I, I used them and I was very successful. So I have Dr. Yvonne to credit for that and, and his YouTube videos. Um, the link to the quiz for the session is now live. You'll need a 70% or higher to pass and receive certification. And the link to the quiz is now linked in the chat box. Um, now on to our next session dates. Um, these dates will also be posted throughout our social media outlets. Um, and be sure to follow us at Teleshadowing. Our next live session will be next Friday, February 17th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with Dr. Green mentoring us for a third year in a row in infectious disease. So this will be our third year anniversary as Teleshadowing. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for attending today's session. We hope to see you in upcoming sessions soon. And this concludes this week's shadowing session. Thank you.